Professional wrestling is better than the things you like. There's nothing more entertaining than watching two sweaty men hitting each other really hard. Trust me, I checked. I was a late bloomer when it came to my pro wrestling love story, only getting into it around 2013, but I was sure to make up for it with my sheer volume of enjoyment. From going to my first live event, my first independent show, buying the games, the merch, by the time I realized I was in a cult, I was just having too much fun. For years, the only game in town was WWE. You didn't see Combat Zone Wrestling getting a crossover with the Jetsons, which is the only way I know how to measure success. However, recently there's been another company making waves and has set itself up as a real alternative. All Elite Wrestling was started back in 2019 by independent wrestling icons The Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, and Cody Rhodes, along with funding from millionaire Tony Khan. AEW was a shot of adrenaline into what had become a stagnant landscape with WWE WWE the only place to go for mainstream American wrestling. AEW promised a lot, like showcasing the best independent talent, Japanese women's wrestling, which is the most brutal form of wrestling on planet Earth, hardcore wrestling, which is a little more mellow, and the best pure wrestling you could get. There would be less piss than usual. I didn't say none. AEW has been trucking along for almost four years now, with its highs and lows, but I've enjoyed the entire ride. Comparing AEW to WWE is like apples to oranges, but sometimes you just prefer apples. One thing that the large financial backing AEW has afforded it is to get into the video game scene a lot earlier than anyone would have guessed, and show up a lot later than anyone would have hoped. An AEW video game was always something that had been in the cards. AEW and video games had been linked since before day one. Kenny Omega, one of the vice presidents of AEW, is a massive video game fan, with moves in the ring like the V-Trigger and One-Winged Angel. <laughs> yeah, that's right, the best wrestler in the world's a dork. Disregarding when he called on the powers of Sans from Undertale. One of AEW's first major shows was held alongside the CEO fighting game tournament. One of its first truly awful matches included dive kick punchline Jabaley. The two were inseparable. That's why ideas for an AEW video game predate the actual launch of AEW as a company. It wasn't until 2020, though, that the game would officially be revealed, helmed by Ukes. Shut your mouth, here comes the pain, those aren't threats, by the way. SmackDown vs. Raw 07, my beloved 2K14. When it comes to quality and quantity, Yukes is the name to beat. On top of that, the game would be led by Hideyuki Iwashita, who directed WWF No Mercy on the N64, wrongly assumed to be the greatest wrestling game ever made. Eh, it's alright. Can't make cool hat Paul, but I guess it's got something. So, with an announcement so soon into the company's formation, you'd expect a game to be out pretty soon, especially with a team who was pumping these things out every single year. Well, after that initial announcement, the radio would start giving us the silent treatment. It wasn't until 2022 that the game would get its name, Fight Forever, and some more footage at Gamescom the same year. Live demonstrations, showing off the roster, all right, the game's gotta be right around the corner corner, right? And uh, which corner are we talking about here? Information on the game was always sparse. What we could get were just scant looks for moments at a time, and while what we saw was good, there just wasn't enough of it. That would end up being an embarrassing back-of-the-box quote. The only information that seemed to come out consistently was the rumors that Kenny Omega and Ukes were constantly butting heads, since Kenny was the president of AEW Games and would be in the most direct contact with Ukes. Now, Kenny Omega may have taken Kazuchika Okada to a 60-minute time limit draw for the International Wrestling Grand Prix Heavyweight Championship, but he's not a developer. When you have seasoned developers like referee Aubrey Edwards, who was a programmer and eventual lead producer on the Scribblenauts games for over six years, putting Kenny Omega in that position comes off as really strange. Both of these are simply hearsay and rumors from wrestling dirt sheets, but even when it comes to video games, sometimes the most interesting stuff in wrestling happens behind the scenes. With all the internal drama going on, the hype for this game went through all three stages of Oh boy! Oh boy. Oh boy. Until eventually making its debut on June 29th, 2023, and all that's left is to get it in the ring. Starting out on the main menu and... Uh, 
Are you my chaperone? All of your options are laid out for you. One-on-one -on -one matches, tag team matches, three-way dances. Oh, exploding barbed wire death match. That's not gonna get too violent, is it? If you want my advice, though, you're gonna wanna go to training before you try anything else. It gives you a chance to test out exactly how the game controls and... It's so good. The game is a throwback to how No Mercy on the N64 controlled, so let me just burn through some buzzwords here. Let's see, uh, easy to pick up, hard to master, nah, a throwback to wrestling games of the past. Oh, never heard that one before. Something about an arcade feel. Okay, I think that's all of them. You have a button for punches and another for kicks, and then a grapple button, which you can modify depending on the direction you hold and the button you press. You can take things to the high rent disc strict, springboard off the ropes, whip people into them, everything you'd expect from a wrestling game is here, and it's done amazingly. It's nothing like the simulation style of games that WWE has been going for for the past decade, and the two control completely differently. The one problem I do have with the controls is how it does that thing I hate where strikes and grapples have different counter buttons. That doesn't sound all that bad until you get into a situation like this. Is this a strike? Is it a grapple? Wrong! It's over! Without a prompt either, it can make countering moves way more difficult than it needs to be. Not a deal breaker or anything, but makes things harder for no reason. Now that we have the basics down, we could go in and start looking at all the different match types, but every single mode on this menu could be covered in a different menu, Road to the Elite. Here you get to live out the life of an AEW wrestler, having to travel the highways and byways of America in order to get from a beginner all the way up to being the champ. You can can pick from the built-in roster or bring in a custom wrestler. Oh, now this is exactly what I was looking for. Wrestling games have the greatest character creators out of any games. No amount of laws can stop me from making the power cat. Let's see how AEW's offering stats. This is the most pathetic character creator I've ever seen. I cannot express how sad I was when I first dug into this mode and saw how bare bones it is. Now, I've spoiled myself on WWE 2K14, where making SpongeBob is as simple as 1, 2, 85. But even if you're not going to give me that sort of freedom, maybe any sort of freedom? Okay, so first off, big ups to Super Eye Patch Wolf for being the base creator wrestler. Love to see a king succeed. Eight preset choices for faces, four preset choices for bodies, only three sliders for height, muscle, and weight? Oh my god, that's nothing! I want 28 nose sliders that do jack shit and I want them now! There is so much missing here. Basic hairstyles, facial hairs, face paints, uh, but we did manage to get the Colombian flag shorts in. Don't worry, fans. Why is so much of this game's customization flag-based? You can't place logos, you can't pick custom skin tones. This is stuff we've had down since the PS2 back in 2004. Nearly 20 years later, and you're telling me we can't afford the technology to put lettering on trunks? This is the weirdest looking wrestler I could make. Do you understand how bad that is? The worst part is they clearly have the rest of the customization down. Entrances? Lovely. You can edit individual hand gestures. What pyro goes off? What prop you're holding? Great! Wish they lasted longer than 10 seconds, but whatever. Have you ever wanted to make your big entrance while surrounded by water buffalo? Oh, get hyped! The moveset customizer is absolutely exhaustive. They crammed so many moves into this game and they all look amazing. No matter what style you want to go for, from grappler to brawler to high flyer, you can make it. Good luck making a wrestler who will actually look like they'd use it. Seriously, look at the mask selection. It's pitiful. Overall, for being my favorite aspect of a wrestling game, this has been as big of a letdown as it could have been. There isn't even community creations! You can't download other people's wrestlers, which means that if you find a cool-looking creator wrestler online, tough breaks, you better have a good memory. So I had to take my latest, most disappointing creation, Baron Blue Blue, with me into Road to the Elite. 
After an introduction showing how far wrestlers go to achieve their dreams, we start off with independent wrestling icon Baron Blue Blue getting contacted to be on the ground floor of AEW. Since blue contacts aren't cheap, we take up the offer and make our first appearance at an AEW press conference, where we announce we'll be in the Casino Battle Royal match. It's like a Royal Rumble, but totally different, so shut up. We pick our spot from a completely random card drawing, so I'm hoping for a pretty strong looking number. Uh, maybe an eight. I don't like our chances very much. Blue Blue pulls out all the stops for his entrance. He's got the chess pieces. He's got the autumn leaves. Somebody tries to smite him, but they miss. Blue Blue's ready. After that comes down our three other opponents, and the match starts. All you have to do to win is to toss your opponents out of the ring, which might prove difficult since Blue Blue's coming in with a handicap. Unlike every other wrestling game that's ever existed, you don't set your wrestler's stats at the customization screen. You can only buff your wrestler by playing Road to the Elite. Why does this game have such a vendetta against custom wrestlers? That means that in this, your first match, you can't get any buffs. When performing certain actions, like doing a variety of strikes or taunting, you can get a temporary buff which will help you gain more momentum to do a signature move. If you taunt while you have a signature, you can do a finisher and put your opponent away. Here you can see that on full display as John Silver slams Blue Blue directly to hell. The name of the game in a battle royale is as much surviving as it is trying to win the match, and with Blue Blue being so weak and pathetic, it means that he has a great chance of going unnoticed long enough to try to win. I managed to last for a fair while, but I think Blue Blue gave up at a point since he was thrown over the top rope by the most devastating of moves. A right-handed punch in the center of the ring. Now, losing doesn't automatically mean that you lose, because Road to the Elite works in a way where you can actually lose matches and get a different story depending on the outcome. So, I may have lost the championship opportunity, but Blue Blue's like a stain. He's not going anywhere. Now that we're into the game proper, you get into the rhythm of how Road to the Elite works. Each week, you have four turns to do whatever you want. Either work out at the gym for points to spend on upgrades, eat to recharge your energy, or try travel to refill your mood. Working out involves going to the gym and selecting a routine to do. The higher the injury risk, the more points you can earn off of it. And if your mood is high enough, it negates the injury risk altogether. Yep, I'm benching to... 1,000 pounds today. I'm in a great mood. As you can see, Blue Blue's in his proper gym attire, his finest leather jacket. Sightseeing allows you to go visit the Icons of America with all your favorite AEW wrestlers. Wow, Pac, I can't believe we get the chance to visit this green screen studio. It really looks like we're at the Lincoln Memorial. Yeah, I have no clue why they look this bad. Instead of modeling the locations, they use these stretched out photos taken straight off Google Maps to represent all these places. Well, it may look cheap, but at least it looks really bad too. You can also take the time to talk to your favorite AEW wrestlers like you never wanted to before. Nothing quite kills the mystique of pro wrestling like seeing Pac wear a shirt. Eating might be the weirdest part of the entire game, though, since we take a break from the high-octane pro-wrestling action to get extremely detailed lessons about American food. Seriously, when I come into a game for pro-wrestling and I learn about Tex-Mex food, it's a real mood killer. Once you use up all four of your turns, it's time to go off to AEW Dynamite to start off our first real storyline. You also get more of JR's dulcet tones. Emphasis on dull. All Elite Wrestling's Dynamite is on the air, and we are sold out in Washington, D.C. This is episode number one, the start of a revolution in pro wrestling. You better believe that every person on the stacked roster is jockeying for a top position. He's the narrator for the entire Road to the Elite mode, and when you have Excalibur, Taz, Tony Schiavone sitting right there, why would you let the least interested person take the wheel? He's also, like, the only person in the game with substantial voice acting, so he had to record all these lines while bored out of his mind. 
So the first big match is up against the Mad King, Eddie Kingston, and we can excuse a loss in a battle royale, we are weak and puny after all, but we can't afford to lose in our big debut. Blue Blue is desperate to go for the win early on, and is gonna do whatever it takes to eke out a win. He'll ram Eddie's head into his own crotch as many times as he has to. Yeah, that there's why they called him Old Iron Crotch back in his college days. Even though I ragged on the counter system before, it does have a secondary system where you can counter moves before they happen. For strikes, you can simply absorb the hit, while with grapples, you can get him into a test of strength. Eddie is a tough nut to crack, but we get him down eventually and win the match. After matches, you get a grade based on how fast you beat them, how much health you have left, and how many different moves you used, and with all of those, you can still only get a B+. I don't blame him for grading Blue Blue so lowly, I would do the same. You get money, the autograph of the wrestler you beat, and a total score tally you can compare against… other… So I have a main, is that a problem now? With Eddie Kingston bested, he realizes his career is done for if he doesn't team up with the best of the best, but they're all busy right now, so guess who's available? We bond over Blue Blue losing his luggage, and it looks like going forward we're gonna be a tag team. Blue Blue starts his week meeting Jungle Boy at the gym, talking about how he got banned from the zoo for swinging from the vines. Uh, this is back when Jungle Boy was a boy from the jungle, and now he's just a meanie. You've got a fat penis and a good attitude. After that, we take the time to go do a minigame. That's right, in addition to wrestling, Fight Forever has about 12 minigames you can play. I always thought Hogan Andre at WrestleMania 3 was missing chance time. Not only can you play them on the main menu, but you can also participate in them as one of your turns for the chance to win tons of points and money but at the risk of the possibility of losing. Our first game is up against the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega in a game of AEW trivia. Just no more than the people who started the company sounds fair. Not a bell or whistle in sight, just know enough about AEW and you'll win. Apparently this intense three-round trivia game was also for the TNT Championship since I also won that too. I can't wait until I hate doing this. After that, we get invited on a talk show to help promote AEW, where Blue Blue says, AEW is for people, and then immediately gets booted off. Might as well wash that down with some avocado toast. Then we get to what I like to refer to as the Blue Blue incident. Rio comes up and tries to strike a conversation with Blue Blue about toast, only for him to bite back with, were you ever one of those girls running out of the house with a piece of toast sticking out of your mouth? So Blue Blue's a lovable klutz, but is also intensely hateful of other people and their cultures. Riho takes a picture with Blue Blue to warn everybody to stay away from this asshole as we head off to Dynamite. Might. Looks like Blue Blue and Eddie are already facing their biggest challenge yet against Scorpio Sky and Orange Cassidy. Oh, so this bastard thinks he can be named after a color too, eh? Well, this time, blue ain't a complimentary color. Tag matches are a lot like regular matches, but with audience participation. Whenever the beating gets too bad, you can go to your corner and tag in your partner, but in another weird move for this game, you don't control your partner. If I tag in Eddie, all I get to do is see if I can count how many people are in the arena. Most wrestling games let you switch between you and your partner in tag matches, but not this one. Luckily, I'm such a good tag team partner that Eddie doesn't even have to worry about tagging in. Yep, I mopped the floor with Scorpio Sky, and we got our first win as a team. On the ride to the next city, we learned that if our next match goes well, we might get a tag team title shot, which would really secure my position as wrestling number one leech. After a quick move set shakeup, we're off to play more mini games with Penta Says. Simon's a punk, I might have actually listened to what he had to say if he was a Mexican skeleton ninja. Take from this whatever you will, this is the best mini game out of all of them. You can tell the young bucks are real torn up about losing, cause Nick Jackson's veins are going absolutely insane. Somebody get this man some water! On to Dynamite, and we're back in the tandem saddle with Kingston to take on the team of Sting and Paul White. Well, the combined age of these men is well over 100, so I like our chances. Unfortunately, pro wrestling is the only sport where athletes get better and stronger the older they get, so we're in deep trouble this time. I try and tank a few hits against Paul White, but he's so big they made a show about it, I don't know what I was thinking. Blue Blue breaks his back trying to lift him up, so I just go back to trying to beat Sting up. Eddie Kingston is useful for the first time and holds off Paul long 
enough for us to score the pin and the win. Now that we're finally racking up a few wins, Sammy Guevara confronts us at the gym about taking him on in the main event of AEW Dark. Dark is a show on YouTube that AEW has to give lesser known talents a chance to shine, and the more I find out about Blue Blue, the less I wish I knew, so he'd be a perfect fit. You can use a turn to wrestle on Dark and get some extra experience and points. In fact, a lot more points. Enough points that you never need to bother with working out again because wrestling on dark gives you more points than working out does without any chance for injury. It's at least slightly more interesting than just picking an option in how walking is more fun than crawling. I paint the arena with Guevara's blood in the lead up to me and Eddie's big match at the pay-per-view, all out for the tag team championships. Not exactly how I'd like to wrestle, though, since somebody stole our full-body blue suit, so we gotta wrestle in our street clothes. We're taking on best friends, and the game takes the difficulty up quite a bit when it comes to these pay-per-view matches. You're gonna have to pull out all the stops if you wanna win, maybe even tag in Eddie for the first time in three weeks, but what would that accomplish? Blue Blue and Eddie did it! They're the tag team champions of the world, and we couldn't be happier! It's in the middle of our big celebration that Kingston decides to let us in on the prank he played. Turns out he was the one that stole our luggage and gear for tonight as a rib! Oh, <laughs> what a card! No hard feelings, right, Blue Blue? After popping into existence, Eddie gets super kicked, which breaks up the tag team. Right after we won the belts. So, as soon as we win them, we lose them right back, and don't get a chance to come out with the belts once. Well, I certainly don't feel like I just wasted a bunch of time. Time for block number two, Dance with Death. Just like with the winning and losing matches having an effect on the story, you get a random storyline depending on the block you're in. I don't have time to die though, I have mini games to play! This time you have to throw propane tanks into the ring to try to blow up these barrels, and would you have guessed that a pro wrestling game would have fantastic throwing physics? Why would you have guessed that? I have tasted defeat and it is sour. To start out our new story, we've got a take on Wardlow, who is to Blue Blue what a tank is to a Ferrari. He's big and strong and likes to hit me. I mean, I win because I'm a winner, but still, it's quite the challenge. On our way to the next town, though, Pac tries to recruit us to join the Death Triangle faction. Seems our time at the Lincoln Memorial really rubbed off on him since we're gonna be teaming up on Dynamite to see if I'm Death Triangle material. Now that we've landed in Nashville, we also get the offer from CM Punk to take him on as his return match at AEW Rampage, which is another optional match you can have during the week, and it gives even more points than working out, so why is this even an option anymore? Get it out of here! Also, I blew him off because I kind of forgot who cares. Time to fight Dustin and Cody Rhodes, and now's as good a time as any to talk about the roster. You've got company stalwarts like The Elite, Best Friends and Death Triangle, you've got some new signings like Adam Cole and Brian Danielson, and then you have some roster picks that scream this game started development in 2020. Wrestlers like Yuka Sakazaki and Abaddon are rarely on AEW TV nowadays. Meanwhile, company tentpoles like The Acclaimed, Scissor Me Daddy Ass, Ethan Page, Tony Storm, Wheeler Yuta, Athena, Samoa Joe, Oh, Claudio Castagnoli, where is everybody? I understand that some people just came around too soon to be added, but when you have people like Danielson and Cole from 2021 beating out FTR from 2020 for a roster slot, it's really weird. Then there's the big man himself, Mr. Make him Say Aww, Cody Rhodes. Yeah, uh, he doesn't go here anymore, he left over a year ago. This one's less weird and more nice, because they wanted to cement his AEW legacy despite him not working there anymore. And it makes him the first wrestler since Bret Hart in 1998 to appear in rival wrestling promotions games in the same calendar year. All that momentum, though, ain't nothing to the brick wall of charisma that is Blue Blue. I beat the neck tattoo off of him and let Pac have a turn playing wrestle. I really want to make a good impression. Ah, oh, look, he lost. I'm never tagging in anybody ever again. To make up for their boss sucking eggs, the Lucha Bros come out to put the boots to Cody and Dustin, as it looks like my entry into Death Triangle is in doubt. What isn't in doubt is how much fun we're all gonna have at the next minigame! 
I don't hear any cheering! This time you have to memorize cards as they fly by, then pick who was or wasn't there depending. The question was, which of these cards do you like the most? And the answer was... All of them! Why is this in a wrestling game? After losing at more minigames, Penta challenges us to a fight at Rampage to prove we're worthy of joining Death Triangle, and I can't wait to show him how unprepared I am. We beat him pillar to post before coming out for Dynamite, where we answer the question of if we want to join the faction or not. Nice try, dummy. Ever heard of a four-sided triangle? We'd have to call it Death Time. I've made a fucking terrible mistake. No take backs as it's time to tangle with Luchasaurus. Don't question it, pro wrestling's just cool like that. Blue Blue's gotta break out every cheat he's got to try to win. Face biting, back raking, ball shots. If it's a low, he'll blow it. After a successful match against Luchasaurus, though, Death Triangle attack us from behind and hit their Sonic Hero stage clear pose. Looks like it's Blue Blue versus that bastard Pac at the pay-per-view, and I'll play as many card-based memory games as I have to to prepare. I just want to know how many creation suite options didn't make it into the game so this could be included. After more eating, flexing, kicking an anxious millennial cowboy in the head, Blue Blue's ready for a one-on-one -on -one match with Pac. Everything the game says makes it sound like this is a no-disqualification match, which means I can hit him in the head with as much trash as I want, uh, but I quickly find out that isn't true. Countouts, rope breaks, disqualifications, we were close to banning hitting and harsh language, but we decided to let him have a little fun. Except while Blue Blue's getting to work beating down Puck, Penta strolls out, just as casual as you like, rubbing his skeleton scent all over the ring, and just starts beating the absolute piss out of Blue Blue. Not much longer before Ray Phoenix joins in, and it's an impromptu three-on-one handicap match. Pay-per-view matches are already a lot harder than usual, but now you're fighting three guys all at once, and you either have to go in and get battered, or stay on the outside and get counted out. What is this? Unfair doesn't begin to describe it. How does a match have disqualifications, yet one guy gets two of his buddies to come out and bustle their opponent into a shallow grave? Ref, this is a one-on-one -on -one match. There are three people in the ring, and I'm not any of them. Ref, they're laughing at me. Eventually, Blue Blue's had all he can stands and can't stands no more, getting in the ring and being murdered, as is his right. This match is winnable. You're expected to beat all three of them, but I've tried three times now and haven't even gotten close. Looks like Blue Blue's now black and blue. This is my only solace in my horrible loss, please laugh. Well, no need to dwell on a loss. The past is in the past, except other people's pasts. I love digging those up. Blue Blue's on a talk show with AEW bigwig Kenny Omega, calling him out for his dud of an exploding barbed wire death match he had with John Moxley. See, the ring was set to explode after a certain amount of time. Blood's everywhere, John's motionless in the ring, Eddie Kingston comes out to save him, timer's ticking down, blocking him with his own body. Blue Blue, seeing his glass house as the perfect spot to throw some stones from, makes fun of Kenny for the ending and says he'll do it bigger and better. Since Kenny's on screen, I want to take a moment to address the graphics. I it'll make sense, trust me. Now, clearly it's not going for a photorealistic take like the 2K games. Proportions are all funky, and they look more like action figures than they do athletes. That's fine, and it works out pretty well for some wrestlers like Malachi Black, MJF, and Jungle Boy. But then you have the Eddie Kingstons, Sammy Guevara's, and Brian Cage's of the world. It's a real hit or miss when it comes to the character models, and weirdly enough, Kenny is probably one of the worst ones. Do you think whenever Kenny had a disagreement with Ukes, they'd shrink his eyes by 1%? So after the beating we got from the Lucha Bros, we've got to go to the hospital to get patched up. That's all I want to say about that. What better way to celebrate a successful hospital visit than fighting a dinosaur? First a morning show, now Rampage, everything's coming up Millhouse for Baron Blue Blue. Listen, when you say these hurtful things, things, can you at least make them untrue too? When we get to Dynamite, we're taking on the other half of Jurassic Express, Jungle
little boy. He stands still very politely and watches me flail my arms in an attempt to hit him before the match proper starts. Does anybody else have the problem that trying to grapple somebody while they're getting up always ends with being countered? It happens in every single match without fail, and I was starting to wonder if it was a glitch or just getting really unlucky. So with Jungle Boy in the trash, we have more time to focus on our upcoming exploding barbed wire deathmatch. I'm joking, of course, more minigames. Bet you were hoping we were done with these! Here you have to pick up eggs and take them back to your corner to earn points. Most points win. Even with the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega killing each other for most of the match because they got a golden egg early on and we didn't, we never stood a chance and lose by a wide margin. Guys. Guys, they're not getting better. While Blue Blue is talking backstage about his big boom boom match, both John Moxley and Kenny Omega come backstage to tell him he's a punk and they're gonna kill him. You have the Death Rider, the One Winged Angel! and the children's sport mascot. Luckily, this is a full-on lights out match, which means I'm allowed to do whatever I want. So as soon as he can, Blue Blue's out of the ring waiting for his moment to strike. Since there's no DQ, I decide to bludgeon John with the first weapon I find in the crowd. A bat with nails in it. Uh, I was looking for maybe a foam finger. John Moxley is not a human being. He is a blood geyser. I smash him twice, and he looks like he tests broken glass for a living. Kenny hits him with his big move, but didn't expect Blue Blue's bigger move. A tennis racket. Bop them both, and looks like we know who the real ace of AEW is. And the crowd goes... The crowd goes home. Time for more minigames, fucker! Chip Gather! This is a game all about collecting chips in vain because behind your back, Matt Jackson got like 15 more of these. I hate these. Every single one of them, I hate them. Don't you just love the great outdoors, Jungle Boy? I sure do. Here, out of doors, where we certainly are. <laughs> Look how small that wine glass is. Time for dynamite, and it's the completely accidental return bout from All Out, with Blue Blue and Kingston finally going at it. I also want to mention here that there's no running commentary over the matches like most games, and it's actually one of the few changes from the standard wrestling games that I like. Instead of commentary, it just plays the wrestler's themes, which I prefer. Having to hear big right hand and big left kick for hours on end would be unbearable. I bring it up because every now and again, they'll play Jungle Boy or CM Punk's theme, which is a copyright jump scare. Please don't hurt me, Baltimore. Also, I beat Eddie Kingston. Are you surprised? I carried that tag team. Moxley doesn't want any part of Blue Blue, as do most, so it's gonna be me versus is Kenny at the pay-per-view. I don't even want to introduce this one. I hate these mini-games. This is Sheeta's Slugfest. You play baseball, but it's unfun. Try to imagine. You don't swing the bat when the ball is in front of the bat. You swing the bat when the ball is already well past you and looks like it would be a massive whiff. Make this stop, please. It's finally time for the exploding barbed wire death match. You and Kenny trapped in a ring full of barbed wire rigged to explode on contact. Give wrestling one thing, it's not gonna make you think too hard. Two minutes, beat your opponent in that time or else the ring explodes. This seems like it should be chaotic fun, but Kenny just refuses to run into the barbed wire, always stopping short and just what am I doing wrong? I tried ending the match like normal, but he won't go down. Time's ticking down and it ends up all going up in smoke mid-finisher. That was neat. Anyway, you'd think that a bomb going off might impact the match more, but really now it's just a bog standard barbed wire death match. Yawn. And wouldn't you guess after getting his head thrown into sharp metal and having an explosion go off in his face, Kenny's fine. Heck, he's probably better than before. Seeing the words explosion buff feels like the most kindergarten I have a shield that means I win and you lose thing I've ever seen. 
Despite losing both of his eyes and most of his blood, one winged angel pin Blue Blue loses again. There better be a really shitty mini game after this, or I'm gonna be so upset. We also get to see what a real exploding barbed wire deathmatch looks like with John and Kenny in their shirts and jeans, and the ref apparently going to handle a beehive once this is done. Professional choke artist Blue Blue is back up to his usual tricks, starting beef with the founders of AEW, like Cody and Kenny, trying to initiate a hostile takeover of the entire company. Once you take out Cody at a press conference, you run up against a Dustin Rhodes who challenges you on dynamite for his brother's honor. I'm busy getting a hot dog, though. I don't want to talk about it. In the middle of eating, Orange Cassidy comes back and demands a match on Rampage. Ah, crap. I already used the complimentary colors joke. I was, uh... I was kind of just hoping this guy would leave me alone. Orange is actually one of my favorite characters in the game, since you can really see the detail that was put into each character. Oh no, Orange Cassidy has stance switches! He can go full sloth style by putting his hands in his pockets to decrease damage, but increase speed. It's a hilarious detail, and one I'm really happy is in the game. In fact, it really shows off how they did a great job making each character feel fundamentally different. In a lot of wrestling games, even ones I love, like, it can feel like all that changes is the moves you throw, but in Fight Forever, it really does feel like Orange controls different to Penta, who controls different to Miro, who controls different to Nyla Rose. After painting the town orange, it's time for another garbage minigame. I don't want to talk about this one. So, we face off with Dustin Rhodes, and in a battle of who has more blue on them, not even a contest. In the ring, it's slightly closer. Not close enough, though. Blue Blue weeks out a win, and and gets ready to finish off a returning Cody Rhodes next week. Before that, though, it's time for another minigame. Pit Crew! This game's all about getting knocked off the platform in the first 10 seconds, and then you don't get to play for the rest of the game. Yeah, I don't like the minigames. After that, we go on a scary tour with Hikaru Shida, and you just know Blue Blue has some heinous crap lined up for her. This time, instead of racism, he just abandons her in the middle of nowhere. Why don't the fans like me? Time for Cody's return match against Blue Blue, and it's lights out, which means the ring is littered with weapons. And less than a minute later, Blue Blue is triumphant and Cody never shows his face in this company again. I can make up a more interesting match for you if you want. Blue Blue doesn't even need to shower after a match that quick, and he probably won't either, because he's disgusting. Time to take on the next vice president of AEW, Kenny. <laughs> yeah, remember that guy who murdered me two weeks ago? Turns out he's a wrestler! Blue Blue appears to be course correcting after the racism allegations and took Scorpio Sky, his one black friend, to the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. Blue Blue, baby, somehow this only makes you look more racist. Quick, where do black people hang out? Uh, 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 Martin Luther King Memorials. Remember how I called Blue Blue a choke artist? I meant it. Get him away from the big stage and the guy's practically invincible. Kenny Omega beat him so bad there was nothing left but a blue stain. This time around, Blue Blue massacred Kenny. It wasn't even a contest. After the match, Nick and Matt Jackson come out and challenge Blue Blue to a handicap match at Double or Nothing. And you know what that means. Time to cheat. Yeah, if they get two guys, I get a knife. A bunch of boring crap happens before Double or Nothing, I immediately bail out of the ring and grab a weapon, but in less than 30 seconds, I get completely mugged. One brother just holds me in place and waits for the other so they can super kick me. It's an assassination on Blue Blue as they hip swivel and gyrate their way to an easy win. Like it wasn't even close. After choking one more time, Road to the Elite- What? That's it? That's the whole mode? That was so unfulfilling! Nothing happened! I got the snot kicked out of me, I moved on, and that just happened four times! There wasn't a big finale, there wasn't a climactic last match, I didn't get to make any choices, there was nothing! That... that wasn't good! I mean, the wrestling was fun, the wrestling's really, really fun, but... There was nothing to that mode! I got to see the same cutscenes play over and over again of Blue Blue wolfing down Gooey Duck and lifting weights, and then lose every single match that actually mattered. I thought I was missing something, like there might be a menu that I didn't visit, so I replayed the entire thing with Pentagon. 
Not only is he the best looking wrestler in the game, he also means I won't have to fight all of Death Triangle and their moms at the same time. Entering the Casino Battle Royal, and I actually end up winning the whole thing! That's right, now I get a chance to wrestle for the championship! Make it to All Out, battle Chris Jericho, next week! No more belt. You win the World Championship, and you don't even get the chance to enjoy it. I finished out the mode with Penta, and I ended up having more fun than my Blue Blue run, but then some all new problems came about. You just don't need to exercise. AEW wrestlers can't be upgraded, which means the points you earn from exercising don't do anything. That also means that the entire reason to work out or do any extra matches is just gone! That makes the in-between portions that string together matches even more boring! I ain't playing any more minigames, so all I have to do is eat and see the sights, but I'm already getting repeated scenes! Even the scenarios, while different, kinda follow the same structure. Instead of trying to get into Death Triangle, you try to get into the Inner Circle, which ends up with you fighting Chris Jericho again immediately after beating him for the championship! While this run-through was more fun, it was bafflingly way more boring since any surprises it had going in were all used up and now you're just going through the motions. Now, I did get the chance to throw a bomb into the ring, which was neat, but not nearly enough to make me play through the whole mode again. I got to do a ladder match, but it wasn't much different from the standard multi-man match but with a button-mashing minigame at the end. By the end of my second playthrough, I was sick and tired of everything Road to the Elite had to offer, and I never wanted to play through it again. But that's the only mode of any substance in the whole game! There are characters to unlock, like Aubrey Edwards, the dearly departed Mr. Brody Lee and Owen Hart, but what am I gonna do with them once I unlock them? Play regular matches in exhibition mode? Go online? Not a chance of that, because the game barely has enough people to support online, and those who are there just want to cheese out people for wins. This is one of the top-rated players in the world. There is the brand new Stadium Stampede mode, which I'm tempted to not include to keep up the Fight Forever tradition of being horribly out of date, but I decided to give it a shot. In short, yeah, it's surprisingly fun, but it falls into the same trapping that every single Battle Royale has where you're either having fun or wandering around aimlessly trying to find something to do. The best players are the ones who know the one map the best and where to find all the good weapons. When there's only a few players left, it becomes the most boring game ever made as two beautiful Dustins run away from a Yuka Sakazaki with a gun. It's a temporary distraction and nothing more. The most hope I have is that this gets worked into a more robust story mode for the next game. If there is a next game. AEW Fight Forever is such a weird package to me. There are the bones of an all-time great wrestling game here, but really, that's it. And when all we have is bones, that's usually not a great sign for the murder case. The wrestling is super tight, addictive, easy, fun, I'm describing heroin again. There is something there, but for $60? I'll be honest, should you pick up Fight Forever? If you're a wrestling fan, you already have, and the answer is DON'T REMIND ME! If you want to check it out, though, honestly, no. Not at the price point it's at. $60 is way too much for a game with nothing to really do in it. And maybe Stadium Stampede will be worth it in the long run, but as for the package right now, it's kind of a mess.